Hi there, and welcome to this series on chemical bonding. It doesn't take much to see that not all materials have the same physical and chemical properties. For example, metals are mostly solid at room temperature. They conduct electricity and heat, they are shiny, and they can be hammered into any shape and made into thin strands of wire. Plastics, gases, and salt crystals all have very different properties. The reason for the differences in these macroscopic properties is found at the microscopic level. The smallest particles of all materials are held together by electrostatic forces. However, the nature and strength of these forces differs from one substance to another. You may wonder how it is possible to make sense of this microscopic world where the particles are too small for us to see, even when we use very powerful microscopes. Well, the easiest way is to build models. Scientists gather evidence from many different studies and then use the data to build models to represent what they think is really happening in the microscopic world. And in fact, in other Mindset Learn series, we have made good use of models to help us get a picture of the microscopic atomic world. In this series, we will review some of the models we have of different materials and see how scientists have worked to improve the basic models as more evidence has become available. We'll start by reviewing the different types of bonding that occur between substances, namely metallic bonding, ionic bonding, and covalent bonding. So, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to use the metallic bond model to explain some of the physical properties of metals, draw Lewis diagrams to show how atoms of different elements combine, and use energy level diagrams to show how atoms of elements combine. First, let's look at the bonding that happens in metals, such as copper. Copper is a pure substance made up of atoms all having the same number of protons. In this sample, there are billions of billions of copper atoms grouped together. The fact that copper is a solid at room temperature tells us that there must be fairly strong forces holding the copper atoms together. However, we also know that copper bends and conducts electricity. These properties tell us that the forces holding the atoms together are not too strong and so allow them some movement. To see where these forces come from, let's get some information about the size of the copper atom. The nucleus of the most common copper atom contains 29 protons and 34 neutrons. There are 29 electrons found in four energy levels around the nucleus. The distance from the center of the nucleus to the outermost electron is called the atomic radius of an atom. The atomic radius of a copper atom is 135 picometers. Although that sounds very small, it is just over two times bigger than the atomic radius of oxygen. In fact, it seems that all metal atoms have very large atomic radii compared to non-metal atoms. Now let's use this important data and focus on just one copper atom. Because of the size of the atom, the electrons in the outer energy level of this copper atom are very far away from the positively charged nucleus. So although the negative electrons are attracted to the positively charged nucleus, the force of attraction is quite weak. We say these outer electrons, called valence electrons, are loosely held and can drift away from this metal atom. Now when the valence electrons drift away, the nucleus and inner electrons form a positive region of charge. This region can attract drifting electrons from neighboring atoms. The overall or net effect of all the electrostatic forces between the drifting valence electrons and the positively charged nuclei of the different atoms is to keep all the copper atoms together in a flexible lattice.
Although we have used copper as our example, the same principles are true for all metals, and so the model we have used to show the bonds in copper can be used to represent the bonds in all metals. This metallic bond model we have just seen is extremely useful as it helps us understand how metal atoms, although neutral, can stick together. Like any model in science, the metallic bond is not the real thing, but it helps us represent something we cannot actually see. And like other models, it helps us to make predictions and explain the properties of the real thing it represents. Can you remember how the metallic bond model can be used to explain why metals are good electrical conductors? Well, remember that electric current is really the movement of charged particles through a substance. In metals, there are billions of electrons moving about in a random way. So it's not surprising that when a source of electric energy is connected to the ends of a metal, you can force all the particles with the same charge to move together in one direction. Now that we have looked at the metallic bonding model, it's time to move on to ionic bonding. You may remember that Gilbert Lewis contributed to our understanding of chemical bonding when he proposed the valence bond theory. He thought that only the electrons in the outer energy level, or valence electrons, are involved in forming chemical bonds, and so only these need to be considered when describing chemical bonds. This gave us a shorthand way of representing what happens when elements react together. Let's have a look at how he would have represented the bonding taking place when sodium reacts with chlorine. The Lewis diagram of sodium is the symbol for sodium in A with a cross, which represents one valence electron. Can you draw the Lewis structure of chlorine? Well, we start by writing the symbol for chlorine as Cl. And then draw in the seven valence electrons as seven dots. When these elements react together, sodium loses an electron. To become a positively charged sodium ion. And chlorine gains an electron to become a negatively charged ion. There will clearly be strong electrostatic forces between these charged ions. That's why this sort of bonding is called ionic bonding. These Lewis diagrams are also models, but in this case, this model does not give us the full picture. This is because the transfer of electrons does not take place between a single sodium atom and a single chlorine atom, but takes place between many billions of atoms. These particles join together in a very ordered giant lattice. The smallest unit of this lattice is made up of four sodium ions four. and four chloride ions. Three, four. This is called the unit cell. We use the unit cell to think about the special arrangements of the atoms and to determine the formula. In the unit cell, the ratio of sodium to chlorine is one to one. So the chemical formula is written as NaCl. Even though there is never ever just one sodium and chlorine in a structure. In fact, the unit cell is repeated many billions of times in one tiny crystal of sodium chloride. This 
is a more accurate model of sodium chloride than the one provided by Lewis diagrams, but we will see later that even this model can be improved. You should recall that the same type of ionic bonds form whenever a metal reacts with a non-metal. The metal loses electrons to form positive ions and the non-metal gains electrons to form negative ions. The ions are held together by strong electrostatic forces in a crystal lattice. Now that we have looked at metallic and ionic bonding, let's move on to consider covalent bonding. This is the kind of bonding that takes place when non-metal atoms combine to form molecules. Can you remember how and when covalent bonds are formed? Well, covalent bonds form when atoms share electrons. To review this type of bonding, I am going to another model, an energy level diagram of an atom. Remember, this diagram represents the energy levels and orbitals that electrons occupy. The orbitals are represented by boxes and the electrons are represented by arrows. The first energy level contains an s orbital which can hold two electrons. In the second energy level, we have a large s orbital further away from the nucleus that can also hold two electrons. We also have three 2p orbitals in this energy level. Each of these p orbitals can hold two electrons, but we place a single electron in each p orbital before pairing them together. Next, we have the third energy level, which is similar to the second energy level. It also has an s orbital and three p orbitals. In addition, the third energy level also has five d orbitals. The electrons in these orbitals have lots of energy and are further away from the nucleus than the three p electrons. In fact, the electrons of the 4s orbital have less energy than the 3d electrons and are closer to the nucleus. So we show the 4s orbital just above the 3p orbitals on our diagram. Although scientists can draw energy level diagrams for all elements, we only need to work with the diagrams up to the 4s orbital. The most important thing to recognize is that these energy level diagrams can be used to represent the arrangement of electrons around the nucleus for different atoms. For example, the energy diagram of helium clearly shows that this atom has two electrons and that the first energy level is filled. That's why helium does not bond with any other element. It is one of the noble gases found in group 8 of the periodic table. The elements of this group are all inert gases that never form compounds. All other elements combine in different ways in order to get their outer energy levels filled. This can be seen most clearly by examining the diatomic gases. Remember, these are elements that have two atoms joined together forming one single unit called a molecule. There are only eight diatomic elements. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. To examine the bonding taking place between atoms of these elements, let's use the energy level diagram to help us. We will start by looking at the simplest molecule, hydrogen. Here I have two energy level diagrams of hydrogen atoms. Each diagram shows one electron in the 1s orbital. These orbitals are half filled and this makes hydrogen atoms very reactive. When the s orbitals of these two atoms overlap, they can share a pair of electrons and have a filled first energy level. The hydrogen molecule formed can be represented by the chemical formula H2. We can use marshmallows to represent the hydrogen atom and a stick to represent the shared pair of electrons. A covalent bond 
like the one that forms between two hydrogen atoms, will also form whenever non-metal atoms share a pair of electrons between them, forming a molecule. Notice that the electrons are shared between the atoms and not transferred from one to the other, as is the case in ionic bonds. So what actually holds the two hydrogen atoms together in this molecule? When we looked at the ionic lattice and the metallic lattice, we concluded that the overall or net effect of the electrostatic forces that exist between the atoms or ions hold the particles together. Do you think the same can be said for covalent molecules? Are there also electrostatic forces present in a covalent bond? Well, in our next lesson, we will focus on the covalent bond and look for evidence of how the electrostatic forces act in this bond. To help you consolidate what you have learned, try today's task. Use a Lewis diagram to show how electrons are shared in a hydrogen molecule. Use an energy level diagram to show how sodium and chlorine react together. And use the metallic bond model to explain why metals are good conductors of heat.